I'm Bill Jarrett. I'm a uh, physician assistant with Hugh Chatham Neurology, uh, affiliated with uh, Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. Um, I function as the APP and the Compass Program. This is Sarah Day. She's a registered nurse at Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. She's the uh, PAC in the program. And Andrew Tate is uh, uh, director of rehab and home health, both inpatient and outpatient with Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. Um, we, want, we would like to share some of the successes that we've had with Compass and our experiences with it. Um, initially, we had some scheduling problems because we uh, kind of a small clinic, general neurology clinic, we don't only see strokes. Uh, so we had to do some uh, changes to our schedule. We started with two days a week. It left us with a good bit of downtime. Now we're only doing one day a week, one afternoon a week, and we can squeeze everybody in. Uh, we even sprinkle in some follow-up patients that are not related to Compass to fill up the schedule. And that works for us. So some, some other hospitals and some other uh, clinics might find that useful. Um, one of the benefits that we've seen from Compass is the uh, reduction in uh, readmission rates. We started with 14% in, in August of 2016 when it started. From August to December, we went down to 4%. And from January to June of this year, we've been down to 2%. So since implementing it, we've definitely seen a uh, reduction in uh, readmissions. We wanted to, we're gonna show a video of a patient um, named Susan Rhodes. She's a 53-year-old woman with no significant cardiovascular uh, risk factors or history. Her uh, past medical history was really significant for uh, chronic back pain. She had an examination, found to have uh, scoliosis, and had uh, back surgery in, in late September um, of last year. During the uh, experience of the surgery, perioperatively, she was experiencing some symptoms that, in hindsight, very likely were TIAs, but uh, they were. she was told that it was likely just the uh, uh, anesthesia and that it would go away, and it did. Um, but then in December, uh, December 16th, she had a, um, uh, she was having dinner with her family at night and um, ended up uh, saying she felt unwell, went to sleep, woke up the next day, December 17th, and presented to our emergency department with expressive aphasia. MRI showed a um, uh, left bridal stroke in the uh, territory of the uh, terminal branches of the middle cerebral artery. Um, she was admitted and, and uh, had further testing. Echo with bubble study showed a possible small PFO and um, and she was discharged on December 19th on Xarelto aspirin and uh, statin therapy and uh, follow up with cardiology and neurology. I saw her two days later in neurology clinic um, and really all, all she needed was speech therapy for her aphasia. Uh, she didn't need physical therapy or, or occupational therapy. So we set that up for her and her follow up with cardiology didn't happen until January 4th of this year. and. She was scheduled for a transesophageal uh, echo, and that happened in February, and it confirmed her PFO. Um, cardiologist at the time said we uh, he wanted her on Xarelto forever, really. That was his recommendation. She was not not excited about that, so she uh, sought second opinion. Got the second opinion uh, in March. Got the second opinion in March, and. Um, he recommended closure. So in May, she did have successful closure of her PFO. She's no longer on Sir Aldo. Um, it's doing better, but she does she does continue to have uh, a significant uh, expressive aphasia. Um, but it's improving slowly. But but she she's got a good outlook and continues to improve. Um, but this is her Susan Rose. <clears throat>
speeches a little difficult. Uh, so there's two things in life, that, two things that have really changed me forever. And that would be finding Jesus and um, having a struggle. Uh, you just, people who have never had a struggle, just, they don't need it. So I'm very happy for the opportunity to talk about the stroke and what it has meant to, not just for me, but really my whole family. And I think it's important to give a little background on, on what I used to really like. Um, I started working when I was 16 years old, uh, as soon as the law would let me. <laughs>
talking nonsense again. Yeah. It was basically, you know, it's one of the symptoms of the stroke, you have trouble talking and that, but it happened in the hospital, and we brought to the attention of the doctors and nurses, they you know, did test on that, and basically uh, didn't inform me in which way that it was a stroke. So, you know, I was, it just seemed like a relapse when uh, she had the actual stroke. And then his, we were talking about this, uh, this is when I was in the hospital for the spine, not for the actual stroke. So um, that is, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say to Sarah is uh, here we are in the, the hospital for the spinal surgery. Really, um, I don't think any of the doctors warned me that I mean, I could have a stroke, have stroke after when I got home or after this very large um, invasive surgery. Um, so that's just one of the things that that I would like to put out there to the medical field is is um, you know we really I'll go further in my story that is later, but that is one of the things that. And uh, he brought me my breakfast and he said, 
say, oh, he was in our rigid class and do some things outside. So we kind of um, tended to meet the requirements. And I ended up being able to do that
real, not only to program managers, but, but also real to the, to the doctors. Again, the strokes don't just happen to all, to all people. Um, and they can happen for many, many reasons, but uh, I hope that there's more awareness of that that the symptoms could be just one thing. It could happen to anyone. Um, I'm just very thankful. I'm grateful that I am still alive today and that I have the uh, opportunity to, to speak. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. I've written this letter 
just to touch on things that most of um, you've heard already today from the other PACs, I think, first of all, you have to find out what works for you in your hospital as far as your process. Um, for us, when we first started, we really wanted to utilize our admission and discharge order sets. So we got with our MIS department to include to contact me before the patient was discharged. That just helps us identify stroke and TIA patients to include in the program. Um, I get core measure emails every day, um, again, to help identify stroke and TIA patients. We educated all of our staff on the COMPASS program before we began um, so that everybody would be on the same page. That includes the stroke unit, the ICU, the ED, home health. We went to Yakin Valley Home Health and did that. Um, one of the most important things for us has been to include a case manager as part of our team. Um, she emails me on the weekend to let me know if there's been patients discharged on the weekend. She's just very instrumental. Um, she's my contact person when I don't know what resources are available or um, what we can do for patients. I also attend daily rounds, multidisciplinary rounds. Uh, home health attends our physicians. Um, again, that's just another good way to identify patients. Um, the face-to-face -face encounter with the patient is so important um, to build that relationship, that initial relationship, and to get their trust. Um, it just kind of establishes your whole process. And then you also need administrative support. Um, that's another, another big part of this. You have to have leadership support because you, um, you're going to need backup and help with the program. Um, <clears throat> to the patient encounter, so of course you're going to provide them with a compass folder and I know you've already seen that. Um, I sat down on the bed with them just as Dawn did this morning and I go over everything that's in it, uh, the blood pressure log, the, oh, everything, so that they know what they're getting. I also provide stroke education in the packet. Even though the nurses on the floor um, give them all that information at discharge, I still, I also do it. Um, I just don't think we can educate these patients enough. Um, I schedule their appointment while I'm sitting there with them, just as Dawn said this morning. Um, I try to get it within four to six days. Um, that way, if they do need to reschedule, we can still meet the 14-day window. Um, I always tell them when to expect a phone call from me. So, a lot of high-risk patients or patients I think may not can get their medications or things like that, I'll say, I'm going to call you tomorrow. What's the best time to call? Or I'm going to call you in two days. What's the best time to call? What time do you get up? Um, I think that also gives them some ownership to tell you what time to call. Um, and it also, you know, makes them more apt to answer the telephone. I take a face sheet with me just to confirm their telephone number and address because it can um, be wrong or, you know. And then while I'm in the room, I assess the need for home health or other community resources. So. I always say, um, has the physical therapist been in to evaluate you? Have you talked to the case manager? Um, you're on a couple of new medications, because I like to look at the discharge metric before I go in line. Um, and our pharmacist is very proactive in talking to them about new medications while they're in the hospital. Um, and sometimes if they do qualify for home health, Andrew or one of his um, team members will also talk to them for us. The telephone encounter is just like the face-to-face -face encounter. Of course, face-to-face -face is gold. Um, just because you build that relationship, but if you do have to do it on the telephone, you just do the same thing. Open the packet, go over everything in the packet with the patient, make sure they don't have any questions, make sure you educate them, mail the packet, um, confirm their follow-up appointment. For us, um, especially over the weekend, that's the biggest time we do the telephone uh, calls are on Monday, and I think somebody else said that too. But um, we don't have a PAC on the weekend. And our case manager, although she's awesome at telling them I'm going to call, she doesn't schedule their appointment. So I do all of that on Monday. Um, and then again, while you're on the phone, assess the need for home health or other community resources. So the two day call, um, like I said, I call the patient within 24 to 48 hours. A lot of times, and I think Dawn mentioned this too, I call them the next day. Um, that way, if they don't answer the phone, I have another day to call them. Um, also, I like to call them the next day just to make sure they picked up their medications, their new medicines and things like that. Um, while we're on the phone, I review their medications, ask them about stroke symptoms, which you'll get the checklist to go through um, for the new PAC signing on. Um, Compass provides all that. Um, I like to take this opportunity to reinforce stroke education, signs and symptoms of stroke, when to call 911, um, the patient's risk factors, 
the importance of medication compliance and follow-up. Confirm their appointment while they're on the phone. That way you can reschedule if you need to. And remind the patient of your contact information. So I always say, I gave you a card while you were in the hospital. I gave you a refrigerator magnet while you were in the hospital. But I'm Sarah. Here's my number again. However, if you're having stroke symptoms, please do not call me. Please call 911 <laughs> because I've had that um, during the follow-up appointment, um, Bill, you can chime in if you want to, but I reinforce education while they're there. Um, everybody has their own process. While I'm in the room, I get the consent form signed just because if we get real busy and Bill goes in after me, I don't always have time to go back before they leave or um, it is a long appointment. I also remind them that I'm going to call it 30 days and it's 60 days. Um, and that you guys, or that Chapel Hill will call it 90 days with their survey. Many of these patients do want to help. They just like a reminder because if you don't tell them, even though they get a reminder from um, Compass, they trust you because you're the one that's following them. I also remind the caregiver, like we just discussed, that um, they're also going to receive a 90 day survey because we want to know um, their input also. Um, we then generate the e-care plan. Bill reviews that with them. Um, and then some patients he schedules for um, to continue to follow if we need to. Look, patients like Susan, we still see her in the office. <coughs> Helpful tips. Communication is so important. Uh, the multidisciplinary team, home health, the case manager, pharmacy, um, the attending physician, the patient in the hospital. Hey, is this a stroke? Is this a TIA? Do I need to follow this patient? Um, the neurology team, um, our clinic, has been awesome in providing um, slots so that we can put patients in, so that we can see patients when they come out of the hospital. Um, communication with home health and outpatient rehab. Um, and then of course, communication with the patient and the caregiver. Education, um, I know I've stressed that a lot, but I think that's one of the most important things is to educate the patient and the caregiver just throughout this process. You also are gonna need a backup PAC. Um, Last year, my son had the flu for a week, and then I had the flu for a week, and so we would have been out, you know, without a PAC for two weeks had Emily not been there to help cover for me. Um, and then support from leadership, as you see, Emily's here, she's our stroke coordinator. Andrew Tate's here, he's the director of Yakima Valley Home Health. You have to have support from your leadership for this to be successful. Nobody's ever offered me a microphone before. <laughs> uh, so, as she mentioned, I'm the director of uh, rehab services and also the director of our home health agency for the hospital. Um, we've, we've made Compass a, a priority um, in that uh, for, for each of our departments, we want education for all of our staff members. Um, we want that to, uh, to have continuity across our service line, that everybody's doing the exact same thing for the same reason um, with uh, a little closer. Okay. Um, everybody's doing the exact same thing with each patient uh, for the same common goal. Uh, for our process, uh, we're uh, following the inpatient uh, evaluation, uh, PT and the, and the PAC uh, case manager collaborate to determine the best transition of care. So transitions of care, they're always difficult for um, for patients, no matter what, what you're in the hospital for. Uh, with a stroke, you have not, you don't have much of a choice. You got to get there. Um, once you're there and you're feeling a little better a few days later, it's hard to make that follow-up appointment. It's hard to let a therapist come into your home. It's hard to let a nurse come in and review all your medications, ask you a thousand different questions. Um, so trying to make those transitions of care easy and simple, um, that's, that's what we're there for. Um, somebody from Home Health, we attend multidisciplinary rounds every day. Um, Sarah is relentless. She, uh, she will be there every day, jumping up and down, saying we need this for this person, and that's perfect. Um, following the seven and 14 day appointments, um, the, our, we have a lead nurse and a lead therapist um, in each setting. Um, Sarah makes sure to get in their e-care plan um, that we can follow along with that as well. Um, open communication among the PAC and the home health and outpatient team. If Sarah doesn't hear back from me, she'll shoot me a text or come find me physically. So um, again, relentless and thorough. I think that's probably been the success of our, our uh, process with Compass so far. You jumped up and down. So um, let's see. So home health team member, we're gonna um, we're gonna visit these high risk patients within 24 hours of discharge. I'm sorry, a little closer. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna be there within 24 hours of discharge. If that means that we need to come the same day, uh, it's a non-billable visit for us. 
but we're going to do whatever we need to do to be able to prevent that patient from returning to the emergency room um, or, or having a poor outcome. Uh, regular communication again with the PAC. We're utilizing these blood pressure logs. Uh, we realize that that's super important uh, as far as following the heat care plan. Um, and then after discharge from home health, uh, we also have a wellness center, um, several different classes there um, that we have exercise physiologists that staff that department. Um, so, so we try to incorporate that into the, the rest of the, uh, the, the process for the continuum. Um, we have, of course, fitness classes, uh, free weights, machines, um, and then personal training sessions with one of those exercise physiologists as well. Um, so that's, that's my, my piece in this. I'm not going to finish this up unless... <laughs> There's a question here. Yeah, a question. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you send out home health on everybody or just those that need... The, those that are appropriate, okay. yeah. Um, You're so, not filing everybody at home. No, ma'am. We, we highly encourage those who, yeah, those who, who meet criteria for us, sure. yeah, to, to be able to do what that. What percentage of the folks that you see probably get home health about of the stroke patients in compass? Likely close to 80, we say 80%. I was going to say, I was going to say 60 to 70. Okay, okay. okay. We really stress the importance, too, of a, of a home safety evaluation. Right. Of course, we can't bill for a home safety evaluation alone, but almost almost every time it turns into more than a home safety evaluation when you're there yeah <laughs> almost every stroke patient i would say close to 100 percent of stroke patients but if it's a tia they may not okay get home health but yeah you're probably right probably 80 percent of stroke patients so this is a question i was posing before and we want to sort of dive deeper with you guys maybe an in individual interviews but you know we've heard some really amazing stories from uh, all the high-performing sites here, and I think we're going to hear from another one. Um, and what what do you think are the, when we go to talk to other health systems, they're about money and value proposition. So if I said to you for Elkin, what is the value proposition to supporting the COMPASS program and the home health follow-up? What, what do you think contributes to that? To the I can take system? that one, actually. Okay. I can take that one for so we actually um, just went through this value with Compass as we're transitioning to the sustainability phase and the monetary support is not going to be there. Um, we actually have had to look at this just recently because we were cutting some positions and some things were being changed in a small system. So um, the biggest thing with value for us was what is our readmissions? How are we preventing those readmissions? What is the value of preventing those readmissions? The other thing was is that it has built, not only prevented the readmissions, which saved the hospital money, but it's also built home health. And it's built the wellness center. So we look at that. We look at transition codes. How much money has the neurology clinic benefited um, from being able to do these transition codes? Because a lot of those were lost because it, their primary care might not be a huge chat and provider. And if we get the transition in there, then we're getting that into our system. So it was really multifactorial for us. What is the value of this? Um, the other thing is, is that you know our patients just didn't really have the follow-up. Being a small facility, we didn't have any way to, to provide this. Every one of us has 15 jobs or more. And so this model made it um, able for us to do that. And our vice president of growth actually now is looking at wanting to extend this model to other disease processes. So. So, um, actually, we will follow up with you because we want to get the details of this. Yes. Um, because everything is about value in terms of what was the critical point. So, that's yes. a summary of the numbers you have and talking to your vice president is good. But what about also for the neurology practice? And, and what, what was the value to your neurology practice? Well, and like I was saying before, early on we had difficulty trying to figure out the scheduling uh -huh. because these patients where I would usually see eight, eight to ten patients in an afternoon I was seeing four and sometimes we didn't have the volume to uh, uh, fill up two two days so we, we switched it to just one afternoon and now that we've balanced that part of it out we don't with the transitional codes most of them go through some of them do not go through if they see if they if the patient goes to uh, primary care before they come see us their primary care will build the transitional care code and then it'll get kicked out by insurance and then we we end up billing a 
uh, either a, a new patient consult or a uh, level five follow-up depending on whether or not they were seen by neurology in the hospital or not. So one of the questions that I think we have as, as we go forward with the other ones is that, you know, in some other places there's this competition for transitional code. Uh, and would it be more appropriate to think about saying, well, whoever gets a transitional code gets it, but we'll, we'll bill for an extended um, follow-up code? I think that's what we do. I do, I I do all that. I yeah. mean, so you're talking about extended, extended yeah, yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if I'll do a follow-up, a level five follow-up, depending on time spent, <coughs> then we'll, we'll add the extra code on for time spent. We also just got, um, just started ACO. So the same time we started Compass, they also started ACO, which is also a comp competing interest. Because the ACO can do the transition and the chronic care management codes. So what we did basically is we told our ACO that she's good to work with, don't touch our stroke population, <laughs> that if they can go into your ACO, we'll let you have the chronic. So after that 30 days, we'll transition them to her for the chronic, but we make sure that we keep the transitions. So we had to work through that as well. I think your point too about the value is that this is not just a stroke pay, I mean, for the, for the sake of business that it's not just a stroke patient that this is this is something we want to show that that when they come to you chat and they're receiving quality care every time that we're interested in their health whether that means that we eat it on the front end from a home health perspective or from outpatient or from wherever we're, we are but we can keep them under that that same umbrella at our hospital and then they can expect that same level of care do they come um, back to that's right community? absolutely yeah. Yes. yeah how many home health agencies are there in your community are you their only choice or we're not no so other it, ones? We're, we're being inundated in our area right now with um expansion of cons and and other markets so um we have probably we have four strong competitors and then a couple outliers that are in the area as well and then what do you do about patient choice when they're picking their home health organization because you can't say Party home care is the best, go for them. You have to give I, them a choice. I right? say, when I talk to them, when I go to their bedside and talk to them, I say, um, the physical therapist has recommended you have home health. Has anybody talked to you about that? And typically they say no. And I'll say, um, Yakima Valley Home Health is owned by Hugh Chatham and they are partnered with us in this program. However, you have the choice if you would like another agency. And these are the agencies in the area. Okay. They have. We're fortunate as well that we, not fortunate, we work really hard for it. We, um, we're a four-star agency, um, you know, and, and listing our other competitors on the sheet. They have Silverview tablets in the hospital as well um, that we can, we stand out uh, among the crowd as well. So it's not a tough choice on the informed choice side uh, on, on who they should choose. I also have a representative in business to all those others, and it's really, you know, if you can find a way to recapture, but you have to note that you give those patients that choice Absolutely. because you're not allowed to recommend one over. You, you know, that's not exactly right. People misunderstand that because I've dealt with this on the tenth floor. So the, 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 uh, the regulations are that you can't uniformly direct someone, but you can inform the patient just as they're doing. That we have built, and now with the ACOs, they're having preferred providers. We're having a meeting next week, and we're going to select our preferred providers from Wake Forest because we're going to accept the risk with the home health agencies for the outcomes. So, uh, and we crafted the language exquisitely uh, that, that, you know, here are the agencies that are available, but let me inform you, like you don't go to MD Anderson, you don't come to the Wake Forest Comprehensive Baptist Cancer Center and say, oh, by the way, uh, we're gonna treat you, but you can go out there anywhere and get treatment, right? So we, we crafted, made it all consistent with Medicare regulations, and then, and we, you know, are trying to hold the home health agents as accountable, exactly what he said. You're a four-star rating, I'm gonna look at your outcomes, and you're gonna apply. But what you hear here, and I'm being honest with you, Pam, I can always get in trouble for being honest, <laughs> is the cream of the cream. This is not in all the home health agencies out there, right? So you've just heard the cream of the cream here. And but that's he, a big value added point. Right. If, that's, if you can sell your, because our home yes. health needs the business. So if, you, if I can sell it like that, it's a big well, but, also a member of our home health agency <clears throat> comes to multidisciplinary rounds, and if we identify a high-risk patient, they'll go meet them in the hospital and say, hey, we can get out to your house 
you know, later today or in the morning if you need us to. That's really cool. But the home health agency has to accept the responsibility that he did and Jane did and everybody else. Your leadership has to be engaged. Right. And, and your partners is one of our biggest competitors for part. We don't care. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's the same here for It's Jane's. You go up there and you say, look, they're doing it perfectly. I mean, but but the patients will be coming out of your hospital. So right. you can do the same thing. If they're right, right, right. And that but Jane if you don't if you don't patient. get this level of commitment from Jane, I'm sorry, your first name again, I know. Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, if you don't get this level of commitment, I mean we're I mean if, I honestly Sylvie's been on the front lines using all of her grace. If you don't get this level of leadership and commitment, they can give you a lot of spitting on your language. But uh, it's got to, it, you're looking at the top with Jane and with Andrew and, and others. This is, this is what home health should look like. And I mentioned to them, Andrew, this conditions of participation that Medicare is rolling out. And most home health agencies don't, can't comply like he's complying, right? So, all these people sprouting up, they're just going to go away because they're, they're going to be in violation of the conditions of participation. But you've got to have that leadership and, you know, we'll do whatever. T learn one, teach one, right? In terms of doing that, yeah. And as the PAC, you're going to want to have uh, close contact with your home health agency. And that's why I mentioned to them that we have a partnership in this together because I can call Andrew or jump up and down and say, go there. And I can't do that with other home health agents. I mean, I could form a relationship with them, but of course we would rather keep it in the huge Adam family. Back to the value question. Have your patient satisfaction scores been, have you seen a difference since you've implemented Compass? Have you looked at that? Our patient satisfaction uh, for stroke patients was already pretty high um, because they, they get a lot of attention. Um, so it was already pretty high. So I don't think we've seen really it go one way or the other. Okay. That's because it was already at the top, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, not from rehab service line, from, from our home health department, we're in the top 90 percentile in North Carolina. So, I mean, for, for patient satisfaction, we're, I mean, that sounds, we were already there. Um, but, but our patients expect that from us. So, um, that's not something that we're looking to shift extremely because, because they already expect that from us. So that's what they should. That's why Ali said, it ain't bragging if you back it up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a for-profit or not for-profit? We're non-profit. I'm by Hugh Jackman Hospital. Yeah. And that's the other evidence that's showing too. Yeah, well, one, one thing that we noticed in the past is that um, we weren't taking care of our own hospital and that um, our referral work streams and flows were, were being clogged up um, by several um, competing hospitals in our area that we were just accepting referrals, accepting referrals, and then the hospital would send us four or five and then we couldn't accept them. Um, so we've, we've changed that process significantly uh, in that our hospital takes priority over everything. And I think that's one thing that um, has really been on our side throughout all this is we've gained the trust of case management that they know they can call me if it's a self-paid patient or whatever it is, I'll work with them to make sure that we take care of them. Um, so once you gain the trust of the case management, they they'll have your back and that's that's what we found to be the case and they certainly had Sarah's as well yes well again talking from my experience here what you get into with home health then that isn't a problem in your sitting and I still have the emails in my back file they, <laughs> home health gets reimbursed different rates from Medicare versus Advantage or Medicaid and so a lot of the for-profit home health agencies want to broker with you to make sure they'll only take this patient if you take that, which now that is not kosher, right? So, but if you're your own hospital's home health agency, it's in your best interest to take all of those patients because they're going to bounce back or they're going to be sitting in that hospital bed a lot longer, right? Mm -hmm. And that's your, that's your big advantage in terms of doing that. But, but you got a lot of wheeler dealers out there in this space, right? You don't have to say that loud. <laughs> <laughs> he gets in trouble for telling the truth. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, yeah. I'm just, you, we just have to be transparent about this. This is the way it is. I mean, 
and that's what you have to do. And you align yourself with the ones who are going to deliver for you, and you tell them you're not going to get any patients if you don't deliver for us. And these are the ones that need to be at your site-specific visits. Oh, yeah. So be thinking about who you partner with so closely now. And um, as, as, they, as we have said earlier today, um, you know, your two or three agencies um, that you partner very closely with, and those are the ones you want at your site-specific visit. Andrew was at the site-specific visit. He was there front and center. Um, and so, you know, that's what you want to make sure you have them involved from the get-go, and then we help facilitate the training that Sarah was talking about. You know, they partner because they've been trained on the model that Amy and Karen taught about yesterday, um, the Movement Matters Activities Program. And, um, and so that way you can go in and say to the patient, you know, of course they, if their cousin owns Jones Home Care down the road and they pick Jones Home Care, then that's, you know, they have that, that right. But um, for the most part, patients and caregivers want you to recommend to them what's going to be best for me, what's going to give me the best outcomes, and that's what they'll go with. So, and I know we've talked about it a thousand times, and now we're going to open this up to everybody. We have developed tremendous learning modules and that people can take on their own and materials. It's all available to you now, and I don't know how much you guys up to, up to it, or what, up to it, whatever the word is right now, I'm too tired. But it's all there, and people can use it in every capacity now. Their therapist um, watched them, um, yeah. because I had to... Of course, I'm asking for rosters for training for joint commission surveys, and all of their therapists have signed that they did them. So they, yeah. they've done all those modules online. Gold stars all the way around <laughs> for the whole Absolutely. team, and uh, for Susan and Terry Rhodes. So let's give this panel a round of applause.